Hello and welcome to Deep Blue Sea, the podcast. I am Mark Catfish Hoffmeyer. And I am Jay the Hammer Cluet. And today we are once again not talking about Deep Blue Sea, we're talking about another Deep Blue Sea adjacent film that I was unfamiliar with before today's show. Today we're talking about The Abyss. What is The Abyss? What is a 1989 sci-fi film directed by James Cameron starring Ed Harris, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio, Michael Bean, and Chris Elliott is maybe the next biggest name person in the cast. Michael Beach. Oh, and yes, Beach, and yes. of course, Michael Beach does not make it through. This this is the origin story for Carl Durant, potentially, yeah. we'll see. Uh, so the, the story of The Abyss is, is a, an experimental deep sea oil drilling team uh, are commandeered by a SEAL team when a, a US submarine has an encounter with some potentially extraterrestrial object underwater and they need to go down and retrieve the sub before the Russians do in a subplot that did not make it to the theatrical film. And hilarity ensues once they get down there. Leading things is Ed Harris as as uh, Bud Brigman and his estranged Virgil. wife. Yes, Virgil. Um, a nice nod to The Great Escape of a character called Virgil not liking being called Virgil. And his wife is, Mer- is, is Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. They are estranged. She is the designer of the rig, comes down and... Uh, things go awry. So we need someone to help discuss this film with us, Mark. We need somebody, particularly a, a James Cameron fan, I think, to join us. So who is who is joining us for this this episode? And so right, we, this is awesome. We have a third. You're back third time. You're part of like you're part of the exclusive third time group. We have Heather Heather Baxendale Walsh. Like, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me back. I will totally go by Roger Ramjet for the rest of the show. Really <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, all right, so we this this movie, Heather, talk us through it because you're a huge cam, like you're a big Cameron fan. So, uh, w- what is it about the abyss that you love aside from the sweet stashes in this movie? Oh, the stashes are so powerful. Like, and Ed Tom, Harris Tom being Selleck is oh, definitely God. approving it. And Ed Harris being called a wiener. <laughs> There's so many of those weird insults that deliver like so awkwardly too. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is this is one okay, I came out with like a legion of other underwater sea movies this year. I think there was like four others. There was Deep Star Six, Leviathan, which Leviathan I actually watched last year when I was watching horror movies for Halloween and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid and it was so terrible. <laughs> it was oh, just yeah. absolutely awful. But I mean, well, the special effects were crude at best, but it was it was still fun. It was fun. Uh, Deep Star Six was one. Leviathan. Um, there was something else like Lords of the Deep. There's almost the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think <laughs> there's like some pirate one too. Something something below. But this this was the one that stood out of all of them. And my parents loved science fiction, and they loved all of this stuff. So this was something that was played in my house immediately. And I think I was like eight or nine when I saw it. And it's a as you know, a very long movie, and it's a very still movie at points. I It's like akin to when my kid, I put on There Will Be Blood, and the first 45 minutes of it, my littles, my little dragons just sat there watching it in awe. There's no dialogue. There's nothing that happens, but they were just sitting there enjoying it. And that's how I was with this movie. I was just enamored with it. It's absolutely beautiful. It still looks pretty good considering how dated it is tech-wise. But I like the story. I, I loved Ed Harris, and I love aliens and any kind of extraterrestrial thing other than actual E.T. to extraterrestrial. That can saw it off. But this was this was a movie that I, I couldn't remember which one of those those underwater movies it was, and I kept asking my parents, can we watch that again? Can we watch that again? But we didn't own it. And only later in life did I realize that my, my lovely favorite director, well, second favorite director, James Cameron, wrote and directed it. And... Mm-hmm. Rennie I Harlan's guess, your number one? Uh, David Fincher. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll allow it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, love, I love David Fincher. But, but Cameron, and Cameron might be up there if, if you know, he, he worked a little, well, not worked a little bit more, but actually made more <laughs> films. <laughs> he works plenty. And as we all know, he does love underwater. Yeah, yes. he's, he's always working on a film. They just think sometimes he has to invent things to make them. This is true. Well, well and that's it. And he gets... <laughs> immersed in, in what he's doing and uh i, I hadn't watched it <laughs> yeah. that, that hit about seven seconds yeah we both so took a little while on that one <laughs> he gets he does get immersed in every job 
Like, it, it, he could be making like a Sahara movie and he gets immersed in it, but then the water bit. Oh, that was perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for following me down that path. <laughs> I'm used to my jokes not landing well or landing at all. Hey, if you could um, make a combined five of Fincher and Cameron films, what five would you be? So you go to a desert island and you could take five Cameron and Nolan films. Which five do you take? Okay, I would take seven. I would take you can't. You can only take five. No, I would. I would take. I would take seven. I would take Aliens. I would take Terminator Two. I would take probably Fight Club. Oh, I don't know. It's between Terminator or True Lies because I can laugh at True Lies and I can watch it over and over again because it's just so much fun. No Terminator, because I need Michael Bean in my life. Yeah, those would be yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. I that agree. was quick. That yeah. was good. It's. It, I, I could change my mind tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But no Curious Case of Benjamin Button? Oh. You know, I think that's the only film of his that I, I, I can't really sit through. And I don't blame him for Alien 3. And there's parts of it I really like, so I'm I'm not angry about that one. Oh, I'm it's big just, in Alien 3. They took uh, a swing on that. It's it's really it has some really really cool ideas and concepts and unfortunately the the CGI used in it and some of the twists and turns went a bit foul but I rewatched that one a couple of years ago and and I'm like I don't hate this as much anymore why was I so bitter oh they because they killed Ripley but she didn't really die so it was fine and they killed Bean they, yeah off screen oh yeah yeah after everything they went through and then they just kill him and it's oh. an off screen death no yeah. And I saw it in the theater with my parents, and I remember just sitting through the whole entire movie pissed off. <laughs> I was mad. We walked out, and I had my hands all bunched up and fists, and my mom and dad were like, that wasn't that great. And I was like, Bleh! a little girl just <laughs> Just I slapping was... people's popcorn out of their hands. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It was full, full of rage. I don't think, I think that was one of my first experiences, like really, really being mad at a movie and hate Charles? watching it. Charles S. Dutton has sacrificed himself in a lot of movies. Legion, Alien 3, yeah. Mimic. Mimic. It's like, come on, man. He's, he's quite admit. good at it, though. Yeah, it's true. I'll draw him away. And, I'll and make then, a... yeah. also, you have Charles Dance in there, who is killed off so early. And and kind of freakishly. But it, I, I, what I did like about it was that it, uh, you know... It, Brought, pulled back that whole horror horror sense from the first one and being kind of stuck again. And I like the prison thing. There's some really cool parts of it, but kill Michael Bean. I'm tired of Michael Bean dying, except in this movie. He eats it in this one. He does. We, we, we have a two hour and 20 minute film to discuss and we are to a different film, different director, different everything. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> he, he, I mean, listen, connected. <laughs> this movie, there's almost too much to it right, because you watch it and I mean, listen, I love the production. So the production design by what Leslie Dilly was, who was an art director on New Hope, Return of the Jedi, Raiders, top notch. I mean, they filmed in like a, a abandoned nuclear power plant. Just yeah. that story blows my mind. Uh, the cinematography, they had to develop new cameras for this by uh, Mikel Solomon, who went and directed uh, Hard Rain, <laughs> learned a lot <laughs> from this movie and Band of Brothers, which I love, but it's. It's tough because you have so much, like, I was going to say under the surface, oh, brother. You have so much, like, there's so many behind-the-scenes stories, and then the movie itself, I think, still looks beautiful because of the, that they built those sets to last because they were underwater. Like, they couldn't just build jabroni sets. Like, they yeah. had to really build it. So you walk through this world, and it just looks beautiful. Uh, and then you have the whole James Cameron of it all, where, I don't know, I, I was thinking about this. I was Watching the behind-the-scenes footage, there's an hour-long uh, documentary about the making of it called Under Pressure. And a lot of the people are saying that Cameron – what I like about Cameron is I can't speak for his – like, I've never been on one of his sets. But what I do like about him is he will be underwater for 47 hours straight. Uh, that, I mean, that's obviously like, hyperbole. But he is on the ground floor with you. He is there working. He is – like, he. I don't think he would have his actors do something that he wouldn't do. Like, he would put himself – through it and i respect that and you know i've been on film sets before uh, where it's been a wildly windy day and they tell people to stand on the gigantic flags and silks that are hanging up so they don't blow away 
But the fact is, if wind catches that thing, you're going with it. So you have these people who are wildly unsafe on set. And like, I don't, but then you're with Cameron and I just, I love like, you know, the director's way far away. Like, I feel like Cameron would step on one of those silks and direct, like someone needs to hold this thing down. I got it. But he would I would just I stand on like, it and yell at people. I feel like James yeah. Cameron just loves being underwater. So I feel yeah. like he made this film to give himself the excuse of being underwater for 12 hours a day for, for five solid months, just so he could do it. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, I'll make a film at the same time, I guess. But I get to I'm diving all the time. Hurrah. I'm going to make uh, make my own little personal diving center with this huge set in it. Yeah. I, well, I love that about him, too, he, though. He yeah. really is. And, and he, he's an innovator. He's a visionary. And he doesn't half-ass anything that he does. And, you know, there's... Something that I love about this movie too, and and I, the la- I rewatched it last year, so I saw it recently, and I hadn't watched it in a decade, so it was kind of fresh to me again. And it's that sense of awe you get, and you got that in a lot of like the mid to late '80s, early '90s movies. Spielberg, Zemeckis, they all do that really, really well. And in this movie, you know, he'd spend so much time on one shot and just let it live, and it makes it so tangible and real. And and then you have like the amazing set. You have this abandoned nuclear facility and you look at like Bud's desk and you just see all these little little idiosyncrasies in the background and everything just feels so real. And you still have going through all those rooms. You're actually watching as they go through it. You're following the characters. It makes you feel like you're part of it and like you're there. And a lot of movies and movie makers now, now that they have access to these easy special effects and CGI, they forget about that and forget how how important that is. And I think that's why we are starting to see a lot more practical effects being used now, too. It takes longer, but it's it's much better, and it's a completely different experience. And whether you like Cameron's movies or not, there there has to be some amount of respect for, for what he does. And And this is one of those movies that, watching it again, it's just... It's just incredible. And and again, I, it's something he said about Aliens, too. He said he would never remaster it or, or or add any other things into it because it was such an achievement of what he did at that time, that that movie should sit as it is forever. And it looks just as good however many years later. And I think yeah. The Abyss, it has a few things that, you know, could use a little touching up. But for the most part, it's it's pretty incredible to watch and look at and realize how old it is. Oh, the CGI is incredible. The, the, it, was all, it was groundbreaking at the time. You can, you can see the, the stepping stones between this and Terminator 2 in terms of the, the liquid face and the, the liquid like, yeah. probe <laughs> tendril thing. But even like the underwater uh, aliens when they get towards, them in, towards the end, it all looks incredible. What are we? 30, 30, 32 years later. Uh, yeah. Well, I think what he did, what he did, I mean, it's the same thing that's what Spielberg talks about with Jurassic Park, where there aren't that many visual effects shots yeah. in Jurassic Park. They they built the visual effects around, like, they didn't just make a movie with special effects. The special effects highlighted everything they had built. So I think that's why it still looks so beautiful is because they used them so strategically. And, you know, ILM, what I, what I love about them, when I hear about their stories, uh, people working with ILM. Like Steven Summers talks about them a lot. Cameron work uh, talks about them a lot where they, someone just kind of goes to them like, listen, this is impossible and we just need you to do it. And then they're all they're like, OK, we got it. Like they they have no clue what they're doing, but they ended up figuring it out. And I love that about them. Like, I guess they just don't take no for an answer and just sleepless nights. And because of that, they've really created some stuff that still looks beautiful. And I dig it. Like those sets, though, you watch like, it's just like, oh man, I like you just walk through them, and exactly like you said, Heather, the the tchotchkes on their desks make me so happy. And I feel like the actors, they're better when they're actually in those suits, when they're in the submersibles. I was listening to Alfonso Cuarón talk about Roma, and he had a bunch of non-actors in that movie. So he built the like a, he built a house, but instead of building it cheaply, he bought like nice tile. So when the the actors walked barefoot on the floor, they could feel the tile. Like on their feet, obviously not on their heads, but that made them their performances better because he didn't want them in just a set. Like he wanted to build and make it better, and that's why the movie looks so beautiful. So yeah, 1989, this thing still holds up. Big yeah, time, Mr. yeah. Lady. Big time. I mean, it's, I, don't know. I love it.